privilege to be here with our, our guests. Uh, they've flown here from across the country. Those of you that know, each of our speakers has come uh, from New York City for two of them and one of them from Michigan. It really is an honor for, for me to be moderating this session. The discussion that we had today about ISF <clears throat> is one that really is an inspiring story. It's an inspiring story about an attempt for an organization to empower, to invest in the next generation. It's an attempt to provide the support for the next generation of Muslims to be active in the political arena. 20 years ago when I started in this field, there were very few people involved in the political arena. And in many ways, you see the growth of the Muslim community and the contributions they've made in many different areas. But in the political arena, you're seeing the kind of investment that we absolutely need. And ISF is a testament to that effort. It's an effort to support and inspire the next generation of Muslims to be active in this, in this field. And the three women sitting to my left are in many ways a inspiration for many of these students that are ISF recipients. Dalia Fahmi, as many of you know, is in fact one of our recipients. And And so, as many students here, those of you that are looking at these women, it should be an inspiration to say that these women have devoted their professional careers, their professional effort to working in this space, each in their own respective space. We have an academic, a professor of political science, we have an activist who is always, always, either on TV or at some community function or at some rally. And we have, of course, an elected official. And so they represent the spectrum of what Muslims can and should be doing. And of course, it's especially inspiring to think that we have three tremendously talented, gifted, and inspiring women, Muslim women, doing this kind of work. So please join me in thanking them for their effort. In many ways, their effort goes directly, directly against the stereotypes that we hear about against Muslims. Because you have articulate, educated, incredible, incredible women that are working in this arena and in many ways doing it to address the misconceptions that many people in this country have about, about Islam and Muslims. And so they are doing this work for all of us. And we should be grateful for all that they've done and they continue to do. And so it's with that that I'd like for each of them to tell us about their own personal story, about what inspired you to get into this space in your own respective fields. And if you could just share your own inspiration as well as your own motivations for why it is that you do what you do. We'll start with Rashida. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. 
I apologize uh, as we all are getting tired. We're all in the East Coast time zone. I think it's about midnight uh, at this point, and we're all moms, so we tend to go to bed a little bit uh, earlier with our children. Um, the way I would like to tell my story, if, if I may, is through a video that one of the brothers is going to play. Um, it tells you a little bit about my history and why I do what I do. I was born and raised in Detroit. I went to all Detroit public schools. When I actually started school, I didn't speak any English. My mom was pregnant with me on the airplane ride from Palestine to the United States. I think my American dream, thinking about my parents who were born in Palestine and just the struggles that they had and the fact that they can see me succeed, the fact that my grandmother, who is illiterate, can see her granddaughter graduate from college and from law school. It's always been about them and making sure that their sacrifice um, was worth it. Every time there was ever a sense of not belonging or the sense of the fact that I knew I was different when I went to a predominantly African-American or Latino school, my grandfather, he would say that no matter what, you always have to fight for what belongs to you, and that includes your culture and who you are. So there was always this kind of strength in his voice and his experience that resonated so much of me growing up in Detroit. Thank you again. It's the experience that I had that created this kind of strength to have the courage to run for office. It's this sense of injustice and kind of feeling like I have to do something about it. My dad was more like, uh, no one's going to vote for you after 9-11. Speaker recognizes Representative Tlaib. I was shocked, as everybody else was, that I actually won. I worked hard, that even though people were getting in their mailboxes, reminding them I was Arab and Muslim. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I was on a committee, and out of the blue, my chairman asks for my birth certificate, uh, proof that I was an American-born citizen, and as a joke. And even though the audience gasped, People were so silent about it. Nobody called him out on it. Nobody held him accountable for saying something to me was so un-American of him. It's so personal and very emotional for me. I took this cartoon in USA Today depicting Muslims as Nazis. I looked at this and I said, my God, people are going to see this and they're going to want to kill us. And I was talking to my husband in our bedroom, uh, not knowing you know, who was listening, if USA Today can publish something so hateful. And my son walked into the door, and Adam looks at me and says, Mama, don't worry. If anybody ever asks if I'm Muslim, you know, I'll lie and tell them I'm not. And I, I paused. Of course, I cried. Um, uh, I had a long conversation with him the next day. And, for me, that was a sign that I needed to work on Take on Hate. One of the things that came up last year was folks wanted me to come and run a racial justice campaign called the Campaign to Take on Hate. And I hesitated because it's exhausting working on any racial justice work. The word hate is strong. I know. Actually, the older folks that are older than me are like, that's so combative, you know, can't we say take on love? And I said, we thought about that, and we think this really gets to the center of what we're trying to combat. One more, one, two, three, cheese. <laughs> and that's what we struggle with. I mean, camping to take on hate, although we're on campuses and local schools and we're trying to teach folks more about who we are, we're also teaching folks that do know to speak up and not be silent. We think that when you're silent, when you're not saying anything, it's almost like you're condoning and allowing it to grow. Outside, hundreds of people, many if not all of them, against the mosque development. It was a mosque moving from a neighboring city into Sterling Heights, and the opposition was tremendous. I've never seen anything like it. We see them at the shopping around here in Sterling Heights. Can we prohibit this? Can we make a law against this? Well, they're cutting people's heads off. They killed our soldiers and everything. We do not need this in our city. Pick another one.
it was bizarre because those are things that you kind of see on TV in movies and it was actually happening right here in our backyard. It was very, very hateful. Like, go back home. This is my home. <laughs> Where am I going to go? Should a president's faith matter? Should your faith matter to voters? And it's hardest when you hear Ben Carson, uh, you know, running for president and saying he doesn't believe somebody of Muslim faith should ever become president of the United States. So basically you're saying my sons should never ever even dream of the possibility. To hear that, I mean, it was so painful. He came from the same neighborhood as I did. This is a man that went to the same high school as I did. I remember being, I think it was 15, 16 years old, walking out of the gymnasium at Southwestern High, inspired and empowered. I can succeed like him. It doesn't matter that I'm poor, because he was poor. I've been to Palestine and I've been to other countries and there's nothing like this kind of feeling that you have in our country, this kind of freedom. In some countries you have to be a certain faith to be a citizen of that country. There is no German dream, there's no Canadian dream, there's only the American dream. Now I can kind of see this great need and desire to see that in my children that they succeed and they continue not only embracing their culture as Arab Americans, but also being free and proud of their faith as Muslims. What dreams do you chase? Share your dream. That also for itself, so, but thank you so much. I'm exhausted, so I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so like the good child of all immigrant parents, especially professional parents, my father is a scientist. I started off as a biochemistry major because I was going to be a doctor. Um, I became the wrong kind of doctor, of course, but um, I remember I was an undergrad at NYU. I was taking um, an elective in international relations with Michael Gilligan. And uh, it was, you know, this was a long time ago. And so we're, towards the end of the semester, there's this new re newly um, released book, and it's um, Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. And we're reading at the end of the semester, and this whole notion of Islam having bloody borders was really unsettling to me. So I went to his office and he said, well, if you dislike it, write a book review. I said, okay. And I did. And my entire class had to read it. And he called me in his office and he said, there's something here. Have you ever thought about majoring in politics? I said, well, politics is what we do in our free time, right? We're Muslims. <laughs> and um, I became a, pol a, a politics major. Of course, I was still pre-med. So, you know, don't worry, I have that in the back. But um, afterwards, he said, well, think about going to graduate school. And that's exactly what I did. I got a master's in international relations, started working at the United Nations, and I worked on nuclear disarmament. And uh, afterwards, I went back to grad school and got a PhD, and now teach it. Um, <laughs> and I teach Michael Gilligan's book. Um, the interesting thing for me was that politics was something that always interested me, but I wasn't really sure that this is where my voice was going to be until I read something that was so unsettling that was being taught. And I thought, well, the only way this is going to change is if we start teaching it. I had never seen a Muslim professor. I had never seen a Muslim woman professor. I had never seen anyone in hijab. But unlike what the title of the thing was, of the today's panel is, I never set out to be a Muslim woman professor. I set out to be a professor in a subject that I enjoy. And I don't teach politics of the Middle East. I don't teach Arabic. I don't teach Islamic culture. I teach US foreign policy. I teach military and defense policy. And so when we think about what that really means, I've been teaching since 2003. So in the past 13 years, I have taught over 10,000 undergrads how to think about U.S. foreign policy, how to think about politics in the world.
And I'm going to do a little bit of a plug because now I'm an ISF board member. So in 2000, I think it was end of 2008, maybe beginning of 2009, I was, a care, um, I was at a CARE New York fundraiser, and the keynote speaker was Dr. Hatem Bazian. And so he said, I need to tell you about this new initiative starting. It's called the Islamic Scholarship Fund. And it's going to be supporting research and scholars in the social sciences. I was like, well, I'm in the social sciences, so I applied. And um, Dr. Hamid Razapur um, and someone else interviewed me. And they gave me one of the first scholarships. And so this year in the ISNA convention, we were on a panel together. And so I said to Dr. Hamid, I need you to understand something. The scholarships that you gave me, even though it was a simple $3,000, the scholarship that you gave me established for you a sadaqa jariya. Let me explain it to you. Every single word I write, and inshallah, I have three books coming out in January. Every single word that I write, every single article I produce, every time I'm on TV, but more importantly, every student I teach is all in your scale. And it was $3,000. So when we think about the impact of things like ISF, it's not just about giving money, it's about what we're investing in. So I'm going to implore you, different than the sheikh, to give in a different capacity, to think about what we're really investing. It's not just about changing the narrative. We're all doing that in our different ways, and you're going to hear from fabulous Linda in a second. But investing in a way that the production, the return on your investment, is not just in the akhirah, inshallah, but you're going to see it in this life. Assalamu alaikum. I wish I was like Rashida. I wish I had one of those dope videos that I can show you too. So, I actually do have a couple of those, but I didn't think of it. She just had these great ideas. I just was like, mm, I should have thought about that. There you go. So, um, you know, I heard the words inspiration and motivation, and I, um, my story is not inspirational or motivational. So I'm just going to be honest. Uh, I'm, I am where I am today because I, ha I felt like I had no choice. As uh, someone who is a daughter of Palestinian immigrants, I was the oldest of seven children. Um, I went to public school my whole life. I went to public university because my parents couldn't afford to send me to the colleges that I deserved to go to. My parents also didn't know how to navigate the college system for me to end up in a place like Harvard or Stanford or Yale, which I absolutely believe that I would have gotten into if I knew anything about that but I'm over that now. <laughs> I'm over it. And my aspirations, believe it or not, as a young Muslim daughter, wasn't to be a doctor or a lawyer, because my parents don't have high school diplomas. So having a high school diploma to my family was already a big accomplishment. So my aspiration was to be a high school English teacher. I had this vision that I was gonna go into inner city schools with young people of color, and I was going to inspire them to, to express themselves. I was gonna believe in them, and that was, that was my, literally my life dream. And when I was 21 years old as a college student, 9-11 happened in my city, in New York City. And for once, in one second I was a New Yorker that was horrified by what happened, and the other second I was part of the problem. I was part of the suspect community. I was to blame for what happened in New York City. And just a few weeks after 9-11, I was called to come volunteer for the Arab American Association of New York. And they told me, look, you speak English, you speak Arabic, you're from this community, I want you to come volunteer. You know how it is in the community. If your elders tell you to come somewhere, you go, you don't ask any questions. So I went. And sisters and brothers, what I saw in my city law enforcement officials who are picking up people for things like name sharing, picking up men in our community, our brothers, our fathers, just picking them up and disappearing them off the face of the earth. I had women tell me, I don't know where my husband is. He, he was picked up four days ago, and I never heard from him. I didn't even get a phone call. And when I would ask them who picked their husbands up, they said, we don't know. These men came in civilian clothing and, and took our husbands. And at that moment, I realized that I couldn't be a high school English teacher, that this is where I needed to be, that I had no choice but to stand up and defend the rights of my community, that I was an American born and raised. I didn't have to prove to anyone else that I was an American. And for, fifth, for the past 15 years, I have dedicated my entire life 
sacrifice time with my family, because I believe that our community deserves dignity and respect. Our community is not asking anybody for any favors. We are asking that our rights be upheld like any other American, because we deserve that in this country. You know, my, I, when I think about, you know, those motivational stories of our young people, and I hear people always telling their young people, you know, we don't want you to get engaged in politics, you know. Politics is a dirty, is a dirty area to get involved in. You know, Muslims and politics and, you know, sisters and brothers, if you are Muslim and you woke up today and you are breathing and sitting in this room, you are political. You have no choice in this country in 2016 but to be political. We have no choice but instill in our young people that they engage in democracy and freedom and speaking truth to power because nothing will save Muslims except for our young people. So if you want your child to be a doctor, that's cool. If you want your child to be an engineer, that's cool too. But do not silence our young people on these college campuses. Encourage your young people to engage on an issue that they care about, Palestine, Kashmir, Syria, racial justice, economic justice, environmental justice. It is our young people that are gonna save us and the way you do that is by allowing our young people to engage in the political discourse. Because when we're not part of the political conversation, the political conversation is about us and that's why you are in the situation that we are in in 2016. So what I try to do this year in particular in this, in this election that we've talked about tonight is I wanted the Muslims to be part of the conversation. And it is why I personally joined a political campaign and I was on the Bernie Sanders campaign. I'm still heartbroken about it. I don't, got, I don't have good health insurance, so if anyone in here is a therapist, I might need your resources after November 8th. But, but understanding that the inspiration that you saw from young Muslims for the Bernie Sanders campaign. Do you understand how many young Muslims I organized around this country? I remember coming to Santa Clara, California. In a matter of 48 hours, they called for a volunteer meeting. And I said, oh, mashallah, maybe 15 Muslims are gonna come and we're gonna do a volunteer meeting and we're gonna train them and we're gonna go out and work. I show up to Santa Clara, California, I found 120 Muslims cramped up in the room because they wanted to be part of politics. They wanted to be part of the conversation. This, my dear sisters and brothers, is, not, is, is something that we need to encourage and motivate more. We need more Rashidas running for political office at all levels of the government, all the way from school boards, all the way to Congress. That's what we need to be encouraging our young people to do. We have enough doctors, mashallah. We are 20% of the medical field in this country. We have enough engineers, thank you very much. Software engineers, mashallah. Lawyers, woo, everywhere. <laughs> I need media, I need Muslims in the media, I need Muslims in journalism. I'm telling you what I need. That's, I need Muslims in the media. I'm tired, I, I, I think people also think when they see you know, me or Dalia or Rashida, Dalia Mujahid, there's like six of us maybe. That's not enough. I'm not proud that I'm one of the only Muslim women in particular in hijab that's on national television. Because the, the fewer we are, the bigger targets we are. So don't think it's, fu it's fun and lavish to be people like us. On, if you see the emails that we get, if you see the vitriol and the targeting that we get from the alt-right wing, the right wing Zionists, you would not want to be us. Trust me on that one. So I need more people in the media. I need more young people in journalism. I need more people running for office. I'm tired of the Zionists taking over our political discourse taking over the political agenda. And I'm gonna end by saying this. The opposition, our opposition, whether that, for you, that means the alt-right wing, whether that means the right-wing Zionists, well, whoever you think the opposition is. Someone told me something that was so profound. They said, we are not outnumbered, we are out-organized. Sisters and brothers, nobody has more money than we have. No, no community is more educated than our community. No, com no community is as global as our community. We have all the resources. We have the numbers. We have everything that is required for us to be a strong community. But we're just not using all the resources that we have. And I will say that 
Why are Muslims in the situation that we are in today is because we are perceived as a weak community. When you think about bullying, no, it's not, it's not, the, it's not the, um, the popular kid that gets bullied. It's not the kid with all the friends that gets bullied. It's not the kid who stands up for themselves that gets bullied. It's always the quiet kid. It's always the kid that's sitting in the corner all by himself. It's always the one that is perceived the weakest that gets bullied, which is why we are in the situation that we are in. But I will tell you this, I am hopeful with the young generation that we have, the one that's even younger than I am, that inshallah we are on a very high trajectory of building power in the Muslim community. Clearly, in your careers, you have faced challenges. Challenges not only from uh, within the field that you're in, those that uh, hate Muslims, um, hate Islam, and project that, and don't want Muslims to be in this field, but you've also probably faced obstacles from the Muslim community that whether it's... You are so, I love being on panels with Linda. <laughs> <laughs> whether, it's, whether it's animosity towards Muslims generally engaged in the political arena, keep in mind that many Muslims still continue to advocate and insist that we shouldn't be involved in the political arena. But then on top of that, the fact that you're Muslim women in this arena, I suspect that that's even more so for some that Muslim women should not, in fact, be in this arena at all. And so I'm wondering, in terms of challenges, if you could share just a few minutes about the challenges that you have faced and where, ha where have those obstacles and challenges come from? So there are challenges, but I think a lot of the challenges is just being a woman. I can tell you my colleagues in the legislature and many of them, I mean, you obviously know where I stand um, without saying anything, but you, you hear it. I mean, some of that talk actually happens among people with titles, people that are in the legislature, and the sexism is very real. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think as a Muslim, I'd like, watching myself as I ran for office. You know, you're always encouraged, run for office, do all these things. And when I finally did it, many of the Muslim males in the community were like, give her money, but she's not gonna win. Or I watch, you know, a lot of you don't know this, but you can go to the campaign finance reports and find out how much money somebody gave to a particular candidate. Well, I was getting half of that. Like, somebody was giving $1,000, to a male person who didn't win, but I did. Um, that's right. Better investment. Um, you know, and I was getting $250, you know. So it was a little bit harder to raise money, a little bit harder to, especially me because of the way I've approached things, I'm very casual, I'm very, um, you know, if I don't have to wear a suit, I won't. <laughs> If I don't have to get out there and, you know, the one of the things that I could do so easily is relate to my neighbors, to fellow Detroiters. People don't understand when I say the first Muslim I ever elected in Michigan legislature was not elected by Arabs and Muslims. It was predominantly Latino African Americans. To this day, to this day, mashallah, like, I can't explain, but my biggest fighters, the people when I get attacked on Twitter and stuff, when I get attacked like, oh, she's Muslim, and oh, you know, a good Muslim is a dead one, and oh, you know, Rashida, she, what, is that? what is she doing? You know, we need to pass Sharia. She's trying to push Sharia. She's the leader of the Sharia law. I'm like, I'm serious. There's like actually a church that has me on a PowerPoint presentation, that, and they put me up there, and they're like, she is in charge of the Sharia movement in Michigan. And so, yeah, it's really odd. So it's the African-American Latino community that stand up for me all the time, all the time. And so, I mean, the challenge is, is, is being a woman in our community is very difficult. Uh, even my mother, when I told her, Mama, I'm going to run for state representative, and she's like, sure, what is that? 
And then she, uh, she, I told her Congress, and she's like, oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, she doesn't know. <laughs> Anyways, she, you know, I already had Adam. He was like three years old. She's like, mama, does that mean you're not gonna have another baby? You know? So it's hard, especially because our, our family, you know, we know our parents want to protect us and so forth, but it's so hard being in a room with Muslim men sometimes and, and how we're depicted just among them. It's just so difficult sometimes being a leader and being outspoken. And I mean, I even have some of the ammo still come up to me because I interrupted Trump in Detroit. Some of you may have not seen that, but they're like, Rashida, halas, you know, enough, enough. Like, why? Why did you do that? And I'm like, it's Trump. And he's a mile, he came a mile away from my house, you know? And, and he's gonna come in my backyard? Uh-uh, no. And get away with it? Heck no. And so I, I interrupted him at Cobo Hall and hundreds of these people, but by the way, I'm sitting, they don't know I'm about to do it, and these people next to me who's a Bernie supporter turned into, I don't know how this happened, a Bernie supporter turned into a Trump supporter. I was like, what? Anyway, so she's like, oh my God, look at, oh my God, look, why are all these women standing up? And I'm like, mm, get ready, because then I get up, and I love that my brother's, my brother said he was at the pharmacy or somewhere, and he's like, he's like, oh, people interrupting Trump at his speech, and he looks up and he sees, he goes, I saw my sister getting pulled out of the, the Kobo. <laughs> and, and my brother Ibrahim calls me and he says, so I, it, my brothers are very, very proud. They're like, man, Rashida, the other girls that were getting taken out, they like two security, you needed six, sister. <laughs> like, 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 we're so proud of you. I'm like, thanks, thanks. But, the sheikh that I know, he's my bud. The other uncle is like, why, why did you do it? You know, and one of the wealthy, he's like, you know, calm down. What did, why do you gotta keep doing stuff like that? You know, why do you gotta jump in front of the trucks? Why do you gotta do this? Why do you gotta do that? And I tell them, it's my job. It's, it's like in my soul. And, and sometimes I tell them, it's like, Palestinian blood just goes through my body and something happens. I don't know what happens. And so it's just something happens to me. I don't know what happens. I just can't stand it when somebody comes and tells me my sons can't run for president or tells me we're gonna kick you out of, man, I'm more American than you are 150%. The more I speak up, the more I know I'm feeling American. I always tell young people, please know the most American thing you could ever do is speak up. Speak up. I was at a masjid and they're like, Rashida, why, why, why? In Flint, Michigan. Why haven't, why haven't um, people spoken up? You know, what is, look, at, look at Trump and Ben Carson saying the things that they're saying. I said, you know, brothers and sisters, what did you say when Trump said Mexicans are rapists? What did you say? What did you do? Yeah, that silence is what is wrong. That silence is what is wrong. Because my, my, I was all over Twitter, all over this stuff, like, you know what I'm talking about? My neighbors, my neighbors who are like, I mean, they like got my back. You do not call them rapists. You do not. They built this country. Yes, they do, and they continue to build this country. So, brother, I'll tell you, needs to be a little bit more love for us Muslims, especially Muslims, because more and more Muslims are running for office. There's Ahlan in Minnesota. There's so many of us that want to run for office. And I think we're encouraged because we're moms, because we care about our children. I never, ever, ever thought that my son, who's so proud of being Palestinian and Muslim, he is, but Adam is scared of telling people who he is. And I will not raise my son in a country where he's scared to tell people who he is. So I don't have Palestinian blood, but I have Egyptian blood. Um, so I'm in, a, um, I'm in a very male-dominated field, obviously. Um, all of my colleagues are older white men. I'm the only woman in my department. Um, I was one of two female grad students in my cohort. Um, and so you can ask me, was being a woman ever an obstacle? Was being a Muslim ever an obstacle? I don't know because I never cared. I simply don't have time to pay attention to it. 
there's way too much research I need to do. There's way too much work I need to do. So there might be, I'm certain when I walk into the lecture hall to, talk, to teach military and defense policy, I know for the first two weeks some of my students are still trying to pick their jaw up off the ground. It's okay. Um, but my job is to be their professor. Um, and because of the nature of what I teach, maybe 90% of my graduate students are men writing theses and dissertations, and I am their advisor. And when I go and they're having their defense and they bring their families and their parents and their wives and their children are seeing that I am the dissertation advisor, um, I, I can't tell you what that does to break the stereotypes of the meek Muslim woman. I'll tell you the most rewarding thing for me that ever happened was the first time I ever attended graduation as a member of the faculty. And you know, the students are seated and the last thing they do is they parade the professors out. And now I'm a professor at LIU Brooklyn. And we have a very large um, Yemeni immigrant population. Some are seeing the first, genera first people to ever you know, go to college in their families. And I remember I'm coming out, and again, all my colleagues are you know, white-haired, bald, and, and this mother sees me and comes up to me after graduation just crying. And she says, I'm illiterate. I never thought I'd see that there's a Muslim woman in hijab as a member of the faculty. And that wasn't my accomplishment. That was her basically saying, I can't believe how far the Muslim community has come, and I'm a new immigrant to this country, and I'm seeing that my future is here, and I am not educated. And so we can talk about obstacles, and I'm sure they're there, but I just simply never had time to pay attention to them. This is like a therapy session. <laughs> um, so I am the oldest of seven children, and the first five of the children are all girls. So my father, for the first maybe 15 years of um, him being a father, was named Abu Linda. And my father was very proud of his daughters. As a matter of fact, after my mother had the third one, my dad was like, why are we having all these kids? This is not a farm. We don't live in Palestine. But my mother, being very traditional from the village, and my grandmother were like, your husband's gonna go get a second wife, so you better just keep doing this and try to find that son. <laughs> and eventually she did have the two sons later on in life. But the reason why I tell you that is because I didn't grow up in a family where I understood this misogyny and sexism in our, com in our community. I never experienced it in my family. I was always around many women, my, my father, my uncles, my cousins. I just didn't feel it. Like, I just didn't understand what it was until I started doing this work in the Muslim community. And what I did was, is that I was kind of like Dali. I tried not to pay much attention to it because I felt like I had more important things to do. But at the same time, I wanted to address it. And um, you know, I would obviously still speak up for myself if someone told me why I was in a, why did I come to a meeting if there were all men? And I'd say, I'd say, for example, are you asking me to leave? And of course, they wouldn't say that I should leave, but that's probably what they did want to tell me. But what I will say is that I've learned in the Muslim community that I'm not out here to ask for anyone's acceptance, especially not acceptance from any men. I'm, a, I'm out here to get respected. And what I've been able to do in the Muslim community, unfortunately, others don't have to do the same, particularly my counterpart gender, is that I just had to work harder than everybody else. I just worked 10 times as harder as men in our community, and I had to prove my worth. I had to prove my place at the table. And I'm happy that I did that because obviously there was product from the work that I did. But now in the Muslim community, it took me 15 years later, but I can walk into any space. You don't have to agree with me, you don't have to like me, you don't have to like my approach, right? But you are going to respect me for the work that I, that I have done in the Muslim community and the work that I continue to do. And what I tell young women all the time is that the worst thing that you can do is be discouraged or turn your back and walk away from a space and never come back. And that's what many women in our community have done over the course of the past 30 years, and I've spoken to many of them. And I always say to people, if you want to do good work, you sit and you hold your seat at the table. And I will not be removed from a seat because someone thinks I'm a woman and I'm not worthy of that seat, or maybe I haven't worked long enough, or maybe I don't have the experience, maybe I don't have a PhD. 
And I think what we have done in the Muslim community is we have created many male-dominated spaces. If you look at the boards of pretty much every masjid in America, maybe like with, an, with the exception of four out of 5,000, all males. Look at many of our national Islamic organizations, mostly male. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing, I'm recognizing that we are lacking the diversity of the Muslim community, not from just the perspective of gender, but also the respect, the, from the perspective of race and ethnicity, as well as sect of Islam. So I have had challenges. I've had people ask me, why do I wear lipstick? Like, excuse me, I just, I just lectured you for 45 minutes. Is that all you can get out of what I just said? Or that, or one time in Michigan, I swear to God, a banquet of a thousand people, somebody passed me a water bottle on stage. I opened it. I took a sip, I put it back, and a brother came all the way from the end of the hall to tell me that I, astaghfirullah, sister, you just drank water with your left hand. That's, a sister would never do that. But, <laughs> Lord have mercy. But I think, <laughs> so I think for us, we have no choice but to be who we are because we are role models for young Muslim sisters. When I was growing up, I couldn't really think of many role models except for my mother who was an uneducated immigrant from Palestine to think I want to be her when I grow up. And now we have young sisters all around the country that email me or I, we go to conferences and they walk little 12, 13 year olds and say, Sister Linda, I want to be like you when I grow up. That is the most rewarding thing of anything that I've ever done. And believe it or not, this year I was telling this to Dalia, when I was at Isna this year, um, the cutest part was forget the girls, the little boys, little nine year old, 10 year old boys running after me in the hallway, Sister Linda, can we take a picture with you? <laughs> Sister Linda, Donald Trump is not going to be president, right? And I say, I say, no, well, he's not going to be president. The little, little boys giving me high fives. And I thought to myself, wow, not, not only can we be role models for young Muslim sisters, but the little boys want to be like us. That's how you know there's progress in the Muslim community, when little boys can look up to Muslim sisters. The current context, the current political context in which we face as a community. If you sort of look back over the last 15 years since 9-11, what are your thoughts about where Muslims are today? And what do you think uh, will happen in terms of the Muslim community, especially uh, after this election is over? I, I think it's very evident that we've been forced to kind of be more public and out there through our service and, and so forth. So many of us were doing community service. I just remember even being a little girl going to uh, various things with my mom and, and volunteering and everything. But now we are more brat, like it's as Muslim, we always are taught to be humble. And now we're like, nah, we're gonna tell you it was us. We're out there, yeah, we, we collected water for Flint. We collected money to build um, the black church that was burnt down. We, so we are now much, much more public, much, you know, not bragging as much, but understanding the tremendous amount of need for our fellow neighbors and folks to see what we've been doing. And it's extremely important that they do because even my children need to see Dr. Fahmi, need to see Linda. I was telling Adam, like, loves Linda. And so, it, 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 to me, after 9-11, it, it, some ways, alhamdulillah, it made us think about this in a very different way. And I'm happy that we are much more out there about the things that we do. I mean, I get emails and notices, and I have these Google alerts, and I'm like, oh my God, look at these young Muslims doing this in Tennessee, and look what's going on in Florida. And it's phenomenal, and I like it. Because before, we were doing interfaith conversations. It's important. We were doing all these other things, but now we are much, much more how Linda would say, showing people our faith instead of just telling people uh, that we're Muslim. So the interesting thing about this past year, since March of 2015, when the first Republican candidate, Cruz, um, announced he was running for office, we have seen the level of vitriol against Muslims rise 
than it ever has in the past. And just like Dr. Hamid said, um, anti-Muslim sentiment is higher today than it was one week after 9-11. Um, there's 78% of the Americans have negative perceptions of Muslims, 48% of Muslims say they have been victims of bias. Um, and so when we think about what the landscape looks like today, it actually doesn't really matter technically if Trump wins or loses, the damage is already done. And so if we think about what we are going to have to do in, in December, November, is target the social ills that actually led to the rise of Trump. And it's not about, well, Muslims are just the new face of um, the new targeted community. This is compounded hate. Muslims are just the face of acceptable bigotry. But it's built on anti-ethnic sentiment, anti-immigrant sentiment, um, still a um, revulsion against that we have a black president. But it also, when we look at the recent study out of Princeton University about the highest suicide rate in this country is of white American males in middle America who are uneducated, who are feeling disenfranchised, who are feeling like their country's changing, that their economic opportunities are hurting. There's a level of economic parasitism in this country that is hurting segments of society that's not us. And in that regard, we are privileged. And so when we think about what the coming phase for Muslims in America is going to be, it's not that we're advocating for just us, like Linda always says. It's about redefining justice so that we become the voices of justice for all, even those that hate us the most. And when I talk to my students um, about the legacy of Islam in America, did we know that in the ratification of the Constitution of this country, there were debates about whether there should be a religious litmus test. And the fear was that one day a Mohammedan, what, the, what they used to call Muslims, or a papist might occupy that seat. And that seat is the seat of the presidency. And so in 1776, in the ratification of the Constitution, is this heated debate about identity in this country that circles around, will Muslims be a part of this? And the consequence of that debate is that not only will there not be a religious litmus test, it forces them to say the words, a Muslim could one day be president. And so if we're talking about this being settled in 1776, how can we be talking in an election campaign of whether a Muslim can be president, whether Muslims should be trusted, whether they should be living in this country? And so when we think about not just the legacy of Muslims in America, but the legacy of liberal ideology that this country was founded on, there's so much we owe. When we think about, I know a lot of Linda's work and Rashida's work is in the inner cities with disenfranchised communities. And we look at the amount of anti-Sharia legislation has attempted to be passed in over two dozen states. And we think some Muslims I know, when they hear the SH word, Sharia, they run from this thing. And, they, and it's because we don't understand what a system of principled ethics actually is, which is what our Sharia really is about. And so if you think about the case of Freddie Gray, a young black man who's killed at the hands of police in Baltimore, one of the first statements coming out of the Muslim community was condemning the riots, not understanding that the level of injustice Freddie Gray went through his entire life is against Sharia. Let's just look at it like this. He grew up in a home laced with lead against Sharia. He grew up in the worst education system in this country against Sharia. If we think about in that part of Baltimore, the number of young people that go from primary education all the way through college, only 4%. That is a level of un injustice that we can't tolerate against our Sharia. So if we want to think about what this country needs from us, it is that principled perception of what a social contract really looks like, about what we can offer America, because what America needs is all of us who have a moral indignation that stems from our Sharia to stand up and say, we will not let places like inner city Baltimore exist, or Newark, New Jersey, or parts of New York, the Bronx, 
that this is what we are going to struggle against so that the seeds of hate can't be planted in the Trump supporters because they're hurting and they're actually picking up this message because of the level of pain that they're enduring. Because otherwise, there would be no space for Trump to endure. And so what we're going to have to do post-election is understand that our job is just beginning. It's not going to be about just us anymore. It's going to be about going and getting into the inner cities, getting into middle America, and thinking about the economic injustices that they endure. So I think there's a tale of two communities. Um, one is a story of rising Islamophobia, exponential increase in hate crimes. Um, I just came, you know, in the past month and a half in New York, two imams were executed. Nazma Khanim, a 60 year old woman, was stabbed to death. Two women assaulted uh, in, the, in, in the streets of Brooklyn. You know, we had a woman who was a tourist who came to Manhattan whose shirt was lit on fire by a, by a man. We had the day before Eid al-Adha this year, Fort Pierce Mosque was set ablaze. So that's, that's one story of our community, um, that we are, being, we are currently the target of hate in a way that we haven't seen in the past 15 years. So that's one story. The other story is that I have seen, and I'm very grateful and fortunate to be traveling the country, um, and I've been traveling the country for about three years now, but just in particular this year, I've been doing work in swing states and if you, my dear sisters and brothers, would see the level of organization and the motivation of Muslim communities, you know, get out the vote efforts, voter registration. I'm gonna be, I, I was in Ohio, I'm going back for a six uh, city tour um, this next weekend that's coming up. I'm watching our community engaged on issues around immigrant rights. Um, I'm seeing more consistent support for the Black Lives Matter movement in this country. I'm starting to see that uh, as part focal of some of the conferences we've been in, you know, recently at ISNA, at ICNA, just hearing people talk about racial justice in our community, something that we unfortunately, at least in my growing up, I never used to hear anyone in the Muslim community talk about racial justice. If anything, I used to hear the actual opposite. So I'm seeing that we um, are starting to understand that we want to be known. We want, to, we want the Muslim community to also have a, not only the legacy of now of what we can contribute at this time, but we're also um, engaging in the conversations of what does it mean to be Muslim in America right now. And when I tell people, you know, me personally, like I'm not trying to prove anything to anyone. This country that I live in right now, the country that I was born in, I have every connection and root to because before it was called the United States of America, there were Muslims on this land. This country was built on the backs of Muslims. It was built on the backs of black people and immigrants. And when our young people know those stories, when our young people understand our heritage and lineage as Muslims in America, then we can be proud Muslims and we could be unapologetic about who we are. And where I see the Muslim community going from now is I can see people saying, 50 years from now and saying, you know what, back in 2016, 2017, it was the Muslims who were the moral compass of this nation. It was the Muslims who stood up for justice for all people. It was Muslims who taught us based on the foundations of their religion and in the way that they acted and the way that they spoke up, that everybody deserves dignity and respect and that we won or we, we gained justice for many issues that you hear people talking about because the Muslims led those movements. And I see young women, in particular Muslim women, at the forefront of many movements in this country. Environmental justice, Palestine, racial justice. I mean, a lot of people, you know, when they see me, I was just in Atlanta, just um, August, uh, August, October 1st and 2nd, at this festival, the Many Rivers Festival. And it was a festival organized by the legendary Harry Belafonte. And I was one of very few non-black, activist who was given a platform on a stage where there was maybe 40,000 people that were there. The last year was the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March. Minister Farrakhan said, no white folks on my stage. I was given a platform, even though I know I, I'm definitely not white, but I, my skin is pretty light. I was given a platform to speak to about 285,000 people who came. Why? Because they're starting to see the voice of a Muslim, a voice of someone who is also a believer of God and someone that says that, yes, my religion is a religion of peace, 
But what is more important about my religion, it is a religion of justice. So what I see for the Muslim community is a continuation of a legacy of standing up, of continuing to be unapologetically Muslim. So 50 years from now, 100 years from now, there are more Muslims that are saying, we are now also unapologetically Muslim because there were Muslims in 2016 who stood up and were unapologetically Muslim. So that's the trajectory, inshallah, of the Muslim community. Just, just imagine, just imagine, someday we have a hundred Rashidas, a hundred Dahlias, and a hundred Lindas. That's, that's what we hope for. A hundred Lindas just means ten, so, because everyone equals ten. <laughs> everyone, e everyone Rashida equals ten, everyone Dahlia equals ten. So, a thousand, say a thousand. We unfortunately have to end our, our program. I know that we could go on and on with these, these women to continue this conversation. I was told to keep it within our time frame, but my point is this, that this is the kind of work that ISF supports. This is the kind of individuals that we invest in. These are the kinds of people that we want to see. These are the kinds of people that we want to support. So in the long term, these are the people that are speaking on behalf of Muslims in Islam. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'll allow the speakers and the organizers to come up to give us our closing remarks. Thank you very much.